My, my, my. That was worth the price of admission right there, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much, Matthew. I don't know if you know this about music, but music has the ability to lift your soul to heaven or drag your soul to hell, depending on the kind of music you listen to. And I like different genres of music, but I want to tell you something. That's as good as it gets right there. Thank you, Matthew Gaddy, for being here today. And thank you, Brother Aaron, for the privilege of coming and being a part of these revival services that you've been focusing on this month of October here at Raymond Road Baptist Church. I am indeed delighted to be here. Currently, I serve as the interim pastor at Forest Baptist Church in Scott County. Been with them since Mother's Day and uh, enjoy very much that fellowship of believers, but they're in capable hands today as Dr. John Martin is preaching there in my absence and allows me to be here. What a joy it is to see you here. I want you to take your copy of God's Word and open it, please, to the book of Acts and the 16th chapter of Acts. And I understand these series of meetings that you've been having, you've been focusing on remembering the mission, remembering your purpose. And here in Acts chapter 16, a very familiar story, Paul and Silas find themselves in jail at Philippi. Now one of the interesting ways to study the Bible is just take a theme and trace it throughout the Bible and see what the scripture has to say. I would challenge you to sometimes do a study of the prison stories that are found in the Bible. And you don't have to read very far into the book of Genesis until you come to a character by the name of Joseph and his prison experience. You can read about Daniel, you can read about Jeremiah. In the New Testament, you can read about John the Baptist who was thrown into prison. Interesting stories. And yet, one of the most familiar and interesting of them all is found in our text for today, here in Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse number 25. God's Word says, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and he rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and he washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all of his household, and he brought them into his house, he set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. I believe, after studying the scriptures, that one of the greatest compliments that's paid anybody in all the word of God was paid to Timothy. And it came from the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 17, Paul referred to Timothy as my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. How would you like it if your name were forever immortalized on the pages of Holy Scripture as being a beloved and faithful child in the Lord? One of the highest compliments, I think, paid to anybody in all the Bible. And after thinking about that, I think one of the highest compliments that could be paid to you or to anybody who calls themselves a Christian is that they are faithful. 
Now, what does it mean to be faithful? I mean, if you look up the word faithful in the dictionary, here's what you're going to discover. It's a word that means to be reliable, means to be dependable, it means to be trustworthy, it means to be somebody that can be counted on. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1, Paul said, Let a man so account of us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found faithful, that one be found trustworthy in some translation. That's the idea. So I came today to ask you, are you somebody that when it comes to to the mission of the church, are you somebody that is reliable? Are you somebody that is dependable? Are you trustworthy? Are you somebody that God can count on? I can see the wheels turning. And you're thinking to yourself, I'm here today, aren't I? I mean, there's a hundred other places I could have been, and yet... I got up, I got ready, I came to the house of God, and you're asking me. Yeah, I'm asking you. Because I want to tell you something. You can be here and not be here. You know that? You can be here and your mind and your spirit be a thousand miles away. And so I'm asking you again, are you really faithful to what the mission of the church really is all about? Studying the life of the Apostle Paul, there's three things that I want to call to your attention this morning. Just three simple truths about the life of the Apostle Paul and his faithfulness to the Lord God and to the faithfulness of God's call upon his life. I think that there are lessons for you and I. Let me tell you that, first of all, Paul was faithful to his method. Paul was faithful to his method. Now, you, you have to back up in the story of Paul's life. You have to go back to Acts chapter 9. And if you know your Bible, that is the story in which Saul of Tarsus, that we know as Paul, one and the same, he comes to meet the Lord Jesus Christ on that Damascus road. The Bible tells us he's like a wild animal. He is pawing at the ground, his nostrils flared. He is just doing everything that he can to wreak havoc on that early church. He's obtained letters from the high priest to go to Damascus and arrest those of the way. <laughs> now, those of the way are believers, they're Christians. It's not until you come to Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that the Bible says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. They were known as those of the way. And it reminds you, does it not, of John 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So he's on his way to Damascus to arrest those of the way. When he himself is stricken from his beast of burden, he's knocked to the dust of the ground, he's apprehended by the Lord Jesus himself. And he meets this Christ that he thought was very much dead, and he discovers he is very much alive. God called him, and God commissioned him. Remember, after this dramatic experience that he had on this Damascus road, he's stricken with blindness. When God speaks to a man by the name of Ananias, and he says, Ananias, I want you to go to the street called Straight. I want you to enter into the house there and lay hands on Saul because he is a chosen instrument unto me. So I want you to pick up in the story now here in Acts chapter 9 and listen verse 17. So Ananias departed, he entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, I love that because... There's something tender in that to me. No longer does he see him as the persecutor. No longer does he recognize him as the great antagonist of those of the way, but he is now my brother. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road 
by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight. He got up and he was baptized. And he took food and he was strengthened. And now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. Now please don't miss this next sentence. Verse number 20 tells us, and immediately, immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues saying, he is the son of God. Reminds you of Peter's great confession, does it not? In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, whom do men say that I the Son of Man am. And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets. And turning the tables on his disciples, Jesus looked at them and said, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter was the one who spoke up and says, you want to know who we believe you are? We believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues saying that he is the Son of God. He is our Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the one that we've been waiting on immediately. I don't have time this morning, but I could show you all the way through the book of Acts that that became his method. It's not to say that he did not deviate from that method when the situation called for it, because certainly at Athens he did. But primarily, this became his method. On his missionary journeys, Paul would go into a town. He would locate the Jewish synagogue. On the Jewish Sabbath, he would go to that synagogue. He would listen to the scripture read. He would stand when given the opportunity. And guess what? In that synagogue, the Jewish synagogue, he would proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. Invariably, there are always those that believe that message. He would take that little nucleus of believers and he would plant, he would establish a local church right there in that town and he would move on to the next town. He would locate the Jewish synagogue on the Jewish Sabbath. He would go. He would listen to the scripture read. When given the opportunity, he himself would stand and he would proclaim to them that Jesus is the Son of God. He would take those that believe that message out of the synagogue, plant a local New Testament church. That became his method. Now let me ask you something. Are you intentional when it comes to sharing your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you have a method that you use? It may be that you've memorized the Roman road of salvation. It could be that you've taken steps to peace with God, the four spiritual laws or the faith outline that was so popular a few years ago, and you've committed that to memory, and that has become your method. Let me ask you, do you have a method? Some years ago, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association conducted a survey and from this survey, this is what they reported, that 95% of all Christians have never on any occasion whatsoever ever led another person to faith in Jesus Christ. And you wag your head and say, well, that is a shame. No, that is a sin. And here is why. The Lord Jesus, before he was taken back to the right hand of God the Father, said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. It is not elective, it is essential. It is not optional, it is our obligation. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And what he said to those first century Christians, he is saying today to the 21st century Christians, and to the 21st century church, I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to be intentional about sharing your faith with those outside the church. Because here's what's happened. 
This church building has become one of the most evangelized acres in all of South Jackson. But the sad reality is, in this most evangelized acre, in this most evangelized building, lost people, by and large, are not coming. I'm not saying that all of us today are, are believers in Christ. You may have stumbled in here, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. But I'm telling you that most of our Baptist churches today are suffocating behind the four walls of their churches when they don't know and realize that the mission of the church is to go beyond the borders of the church walls, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we go, and we are his witnesses. Now, let, let, me, just, let me just date some of us today. How many of you remember Flip Wilson? Raise your hand if you remember Flip. Yeah, remember Geraldine, the devil made me do it. Years ago, Flip Wilson, in his television program, he was playing in a skit opposite of another actor. And this actor looked at Flip and said, Flip, I said, what religion are you? Flip Wilson says, well, I'm a Jehovah's bystander. And the actor said, Flip, don't you mean that you're a Jehovah's witness? He said, nope, they tried to get me to be a witness, but I just didn't want to get involved. I'm a Jehovah's bystander. Now, you and I certainly don't ascribe to the false theology of Jehovah Witnesses, but listen to me. We are called to be witnesses for Jehovah. The Great Commission, Jesus Christ says this, All power and all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples, teach all nations. And you know that the imperative command of the Great Commission is not to go. The imperative command of the Great Commission is to make disciples. It is a given that we are going. Wherever we are going, we are to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I want you to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, I know I come from North Mississippi, so I'm not the brightest bulb in the bunch. But I, I've discovered something. This was a revolutionary discovery for me. I discovered that verse number 19 of the Great Commission comes right between verse 18 and verse 20. Do you know that? Verse number 19 that, that commands me to make disciples is sandwiched right between the promise of Christ's power and the promise of Christ's presence. In other words, I have the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Lord God gives me the authority to do something, guess what? He gives me the ability to do that. And he says, I want you to go. And Paul was going and making disciples. When I took this position with the convention board in 2013, the next year in 2014, it, it's rolling around to Easter time. And a few months before Easter, in fact, and I walked from my office down to the evangelism department. And the ministry assistant at that time, she was seated at her desk and she was packing these little metal crosses in a Ziploc bag, a hundred to a bag. And it comes with a card, the cross in the pocket. And I said, Joy, I said, what are you doing? She says, well, I'm, I'm packing these crosses in these bags, a hundred to the bag. And said, churches will call up, they'll order these. By the way, they're free of charge through the evangelism department if you want some. And she says, people will call me, they'll order these crosses. Some churches like to take them and use them to go out into their community and invite people to their church. So I picked up one of these crosses and I said, Joy, have you ever heard about someone being saved because of one of these crosses? She said, oh, yes. She said, let me tell you a story. She said, just the other day, a little old lady in Mississippi called me to order some more of these crosses. And she said, Joy, let me tell you something. The other day, some men were work working in my front yard, worked for a utility company. They're bearing a fiber optic line in her front yard. And it was hot, and they were thirsty, and so she said, I invited them into my kitchen. 
I prepared each one of them a glass of ice water. And as they're seated at my kitchen, joy, I pulled out my cross and I said, now men, let me tell you about my Jesus. And she said, joy, there was an African-American man seated at my kitchen table and he prayed to receive Jesus as his Savior. Let me tell you something. That was her method. That was her method. And she was faithful to her method. You don't have a method, get with your pastor. Let him teach you how to share your salvation story with those that the Lord God brings in your path. Let me tell you a second thing. Paul was not only faithful with his method, Paul was faithful to the mission. Now you've discovered in Acts chapter 16, where are Paul and Silas? They are in prison. They, they came to Philippi. Philippi was a Roman colony, separated hundreds and hundreds of miles from Rome proper. But the citizens of Philippi were Roman citizens. They were to act like Roman citizens. They dressed like Roman citizens. They were to be loyal to the Roman emperor, even though they're separated by hundreds and hundreds of miles. And Paul finds himself in this Roman colony called Philippi. And the scripture says that when they got there, they went down to the riverside. They're having a prayer gathering there. And there's a lady from Thyatira, her name is Lydia, she's a seller of purple, and she got gloriously saved. They come into Philippi City, and there's a little slave girl, she's demon-possessed, she had the spirit of divination, she's following Paul and Silas around, she's causing them trouble, and finally Paul had had enough. And he turns around, he rebukes the foul spirits in that little girl, and he sets her free. And for that very thing, those who were her masters, they're none too pleased. He's hitting their pocketbook. And so they have him arrested, they have him beaten, and Paul and Silas are now thrown into that jail at Philippi. So they are there not because they've done the wrong thing, they are there because they have done the right thing. One of my favorite preachers of yesteryear was a man by the name of Ron Dunn. Ron was a great evangelist. His insight into the scripture, his dry wit, everything about him. He could just lift the word of God off the pages of the Bible and make them real. And I love to hear him preach. And Ron Dunn used to talk about the principle of the devil after the dove. Do you remember Matthew chapter 3? Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist in the river Jordan. There were three miracles that accompanied the baptism of Jesus. There was the rending of the heavens. There was the descent of the Spirit in the form of a dove that came and lighted on him. And then there was the voice of the Father that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Certainly a high water mark in the life and ministry of Jesus. And immediately, immediately after that, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible says that Jesus is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and afterward he was tempted by the devil. Turn the stones to bread, jump off the pinnacle of the temple, bow down, and worship me, Satan said, and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. The principle of the devil after the dove. I want you to recognize something. You and I are really susceptible to the attacks of Satan. Right after we have experienced these high water marks in our life with Jesus, We've, we've been on the mountaintop experience with Jesus. We are susceptible to the attacks of Satan himself because he wants to thwart you. He wants to divert you. He wants to detour you. 
He wants to do everything that he possibly can to throw up every roadblock and every obstacle in your way to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Because when you're on fire, when you are white hot for Jesus, listen to me, you've got a bullseye right here on your chest, and Satan is the accuser of the brethren, he's the enemy of the saints of God, and he's going to lob all the heavy artillery of hell right at you to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Now, how do we respond to that? One of the greatest weapons we have at our disposal is the weapon of prayer. In Acts chapter 12, the Bible says that Herod had James, the brother of John, killed with a sword. And after that, he saw that it pleased the Jews. He had Peter arrested. He's going to subject Peter to the same fate. But guess what that early church did? When the world persecuted, the church prayed. When Satan intimidated, the church interceded. And they got on their knees and they're praying for the release of Simon Peter. Acts chapter 12 and verse number 4 says that the whole church is praying for and the And the Bible says they prayed fervently. They prayed passionately. When was the last time you prayed fervently? When was the last time you prayed passionately? Not just for this country, but specifically for the missions and the ministries of Raymond Road Baptist Church. When Satan came against you, did you get on your face, prostrate before the Lord, and begin to pray to God, Oh God, if you don't do something, we're sunk. Oh God, if you don't move, we don't have a chance. When was the last time you got desperate in your prayers? You want to know what God did? very unusual thing in Acts chapter 12 in response to the prayers of the believers in that church. The Bible says that Peter is sound asleep. I don't know what I'd be doing if I was in prison knowing that maybe the next day they're going to sever my head from my body. The Bible says there's no panic in Peter's part. He's not wringing his hands. He's not white with fear. The Bible says he's asleep. And you know what God did God sent an angel as an alarm clock and woke him up. I'm looking at some of you, and you're there with me. I don't need an alarm clock anymore. <laughs> if I know i got to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'll wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. But God sent an angel as an alarm clock and woke Peter up, carried him through the maze of the corridors and the halls of that prison, out to where they're having the prayer meeting. He comes, he raps on the door, and a little girl named Rhoda, she comes and she answers the door and sees it's Peter. You know what she does? She slammed the door in his face. Hey, guess what? Peter's outside. Now here's proof it was a bunch of Baptists because they didn't believe her. They're praying for Peter's release and when they got the answer, they didn't believe the answer. It's got to be his ghost. They've killed him. No, God has delivered him. Listen, we serve a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, but you have not because you ask not. You ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. When it comes to the mission of the church, God is looking for an army of his saints that will be faithful to the mission. Last of all, he was not only faithful to his method and faithful to his mission, he was faithful to the message. So they're singing praises at midnight. God sends the earthquake, the prison doors open, shackles fall from their wrists and from their ankles, they're, they're free. And the Philippian jailer, supposing they had escaped, he, he leapt in. And he's drawing the sword from its sheath, ready to take his own life for fear that the prisoners had escaped. When out of the darkness, some of the sweetest words he had heard up to that point in his life were spoken. Paul cried out and he said, Do thyself no harm. We're all here. 
He said, sir, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas said to him, believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your house. He did, they did. And I expect one day I'll meet him in heaven. Because Paul and Silas were faithful to the message. What is our message? I love this in in Acts 16. Back up a little bit in the story. The Bible says that uh, in verse 6 that they had passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region. Uh, They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So after they came to Mysiah, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So passing by Mysiah, they came down to Troas. And the vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. Now listen to this, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. If you want to know what our message is, men and women, there it is. Our message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I are living in the day and age of religious subjectivism in which people tell us that all the world's religions are okay for all of those who may adhere to any particular religion. It doesn't matter. Religious subjectivism. Religious pluralism that says about all these world's religions, there are many paths that lead to God. They have their own salvific path, their own belief in a transcendent single reality they call their deity. But if you and I believe the gospel, if you and I believe the message of Jesus Christ, the message of Jesus Christ is loud and clear. There is but one way to God the Father, not many roads, not many paths. There's one way. Acts 4.12 says, But as it is written, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The Bible answers life's most three important questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? What happens to me when I die? Where did I come from? God created us. Genesis tells us that God created a male and female, created he them. Why am I here? Listen to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What happens to me when I die? The scripture is plain. To be absent from the body for the believer is what? To be present with the Lord. And the scripture is plain about all those who die outside of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The rich man lifted up his eyes And in hell, he was in torment. The Bible's not ambiguous. The message of the Bible really is easy to understand. And men trip over the simplicity of the message of Jesus Christ. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Yes. Not just contains the Word of God. And by that, I'm not saying the Bible's inspired in spots and some have been inspired to spot the inspired spots. The Bible is the Word of God. It is the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of the living God. And if we truly believe that, if we believe Jesus is the only way, tell the world. 
If we believe that salvation comes only through faith in Jesus Christ, tell the world. If you believe that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son, tell the world. That is our message, church. There's not a whole lot wrong in our churches today that could not be made right if we'd just get back to sharing the gospel. A few years ago, they had a reprisal of Jesus Christ Superstar. I didn't see it when it came out originally, and I wasn't too keen on seeing it uh, when it came out in its reprisal. But I was interested because I'd heard at the closing of Jesus Christ Superstar, Jesus is on the cross, the curtain comes down, that's the end of the story. So I wanted to see if that was true, and sure enough, came to the end of that musical, Jesus is on the cross, the curtain comes down, that's the end of the story. Listen to me, that is not the end of the story. You want to know what the gospel is? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. But there is not a period after the word buried. There's simply a comma. How that he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. But guess what? Up from the grave he arose like a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And he is the living, reigning, soon coming Lord Jesus Christ. Tell the world. Tell the world. I... uh, I'll close with this story. I was raised a military brat. My father was in the Air Force for 20 years. When he retired after 20 years, I was 12 years of age. And he and mother moved myself, my older brother, my younger sister and I, back to Mississippi where they are both from. And we located uh, close to my mother's mother, my grandmother, grandmother Wilhite, just out from Baldwin, Mississippi, Brother Tom. And uh, because I was raised as a military brat, I, I really thought that was going to be my life's career. I, I really thought I was going to go into the Air Force. That was my ambition. But because uh, the Lord called me to the ministry, things changed. Praise the Lord they did. But I grew up a child of the 60s. I I was fascinated by everything about planes. I was fascinated by NASA. President Kennedy had had made a promise by the end of the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. And sure enough, we did. Other men followed. The Apollo 15 mission is one of the most successful missions that NASA ever launched. There were three astronauts, Dave Scott, Jim Irwin, and Al Worden. They flew that rocket ship to the moon. Dave Scott and Jim Irwin exited the command module, got into the lunar module, flew the lunar module, landed on the surface of the moon. They were the first men to ever drive the LRV, the lunar roving vehicle, on the surface of the moon. They brought back what is called the Genesis rock. By everyone's estimations, it's one of the most wildly successful missions NASA ever launched. So when when they get back from this mission, the scientists are debriefing the astronauts, and one of them said to Jim Irwin, Jim, a million years from now, your footprints are going to be on the moon. A million years from now, your footprints are still going to be on the moon. In the vacuum of space, there's no wind, there's no rain. But this is what you've got to know about Jim Irwin. He was a Christian. Jim Irwin was saved as a junior high boy at a Baptist church in Newport, Ritchie, Florida. And when that scientist said to Jim Irwin, a million years from now, your footprints are going to be on the moon, this is what he said. It's far more important that Jesus walked on the earth than that man ever walked on the moon. 
20 years after that mission, they had a convocation in Aspen, Colorado to celebrate the success of that mission. They invited Jim Irwin to come and to speak. He went, he spoke, and afterwards he rented a bicycle, and he bicycled around those beautiful maroon bells, those majestic mountains around Aspen, Colorado. I'm not sure exactly how long it was after the bicycle ride. I don't know if it's 20 minutes or two hours, but after the bicycle ride, Jim Irwin had a massive heart attack, and he fell over dead. They had the funeral service for Jim, and afterward, as people are wont to do, they went to his widow's home and sat with her for a while, and one of Jim's best friends came and was talking to Jim's widow, and this is what he said. The last thing that Jim ever said to me that I can remember is this. He said, all I want to do is be faithful. All I want to do is be faithful. Today, would you let that be your prayer? Would you let that be your commitment? From this point forward, you can't change the past, but you can do something about the present and into the future and say, God, from this point forward, I just want to be faithful. I want to be faithful to whatever method you give me to share the gospel. I want to be faithful to the missions and the ministries of Raymond Road Baptist Church to serve you. I want to be faithful to the gospel, to the message of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, to ask you to search every heart. We believe in the power and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. So, Lord, uh, if there's someone here today that's never been saved, I, I pray you'd bring them under Holy Spirit conviction that they would give their life, their heart, and believing faith to the Son of God, repenting and turning from their sins and turning today to the Savior, trusting in Him and only Him to take them to heaven when they die. And, Father, all across this building today, believers in Christ, so maybe they need to come to this altar and just kneel here. Or come and speak with this pastor. And say, Pastor, pray for me that I will be faithful. I want to drive down a peg of faith here today and say, God, all I want to do is be faithful to you. We thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul. But even more so, we thank you for the example and the model of the Lord Jesus Christ who was faithful even unto death. Help us, Father, to remember our mission and our purpose for being here. And help us not to let up or to back up until you take us up. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.